Hello, I'm Dave and welcome to the workshop. In this video, I'm going to be taking a look at a device made famous by the BBC's Apprentice television programme. It's the Jacob Jensen Telephone 3. Yes, Lord Sugar. Can you send the uh, four of them in, please? In The Apprentice, the telephone is used to break the silence of the anxious waiting room when Lord Sugar calls through to summon the candidates to the boardroom. Send them in, please. In the first three series, the telephone used was an emailer, a telephone and email device produced by Lord Sugar's very own Amstrad. However, in 2007, Amstrad was sold and the emailer was replaced with the slimline Jacob Jensen Telephone 1 in the boardroom. In the reception area, a Telephone 3 was introduced. And from Series 9, the T3 was used in both locations. Uh, can you send the three of them in, please? Yes, Lord Sugar. Jacob Jensen was a Danish industrial designer, most famous for his work with Bang & Olufsen, for which he won numerous awards. His designs are displayed at prominent museums such as the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the Denmark Museum of Design. These include the Biogram 4000 record player and this rather nice Biomic microphone. His design studio created the Telephone 3, which launched in 1994. There were a number of variants of the T3 over the years, some with different keyboard layouts or extra features such as caller ID, all sharing the same exterior design. Current variants include the T60 for use in hotels. This has extra buttons that can be used to speed dial reception or room service. And the T3 is still produced and sells for around £100. Now the story behind this phone is that it's owned by my mum. She originally won it in a competition in the middle of the 90s. Now my parents recently had an issue with their broadband speed. It dropped from about 50 to about 10 megabits a second. So they called out a BT engineer who promptly came round and disconnected all the telephone sockets in their house apart from one. Now this chased away the fault, the uh, broadband speed recovered, but it was very unsatisfactory as they couldn't use any of the telephones elsewhere in their house. So I went to take a look and I went round reconnecting all the telephone sockets and remade the contacts with my punch down tool here. And the only problem I could find was with this phone. When you pick up the receiver, there's lots of crackling sounds. This sometimes goes away after a few seconds. The phone has a hum on it. This can be heard by both parties on a call. There's a very loose connector on the bottom of the phone. And it doesn't ring when called, even though the ringer is turned on. OK, so let's get inside and see if we can fix it up. Firstly, I'm going to remove the clear plastic label that somehow remained in place for 25 years. I noticed that the hum goes away when you press the mute button on the handset, so I decided to look at that issue to begin with. It's out with the spludger to work free these silver plastic pieces, which reveal some screws underneath. There's not a great deal in here, a condenser microphone capsule and small loudspeaker. In the middle, there's a switch mounted on a small PCB. This simply disconnects the microphone to mute it. And two metal weights to make the thing feel a bit more substantial. Removing one of the plates, I can see that one of the microphone wires has been squashed. You can see it's quite flattened. Connecting the phone back up and the hum is gone. I found the hum would temporarily return if I touched the microphone terminals on the PCB. I'm not sure if the trap wire was the issue, but sometimes you get lucky when you just take things apart and put them back together again. Anyway, I reassembled the handset, cleaned off the old double-sided sticky tape and applied some afresh. Moving on to the main part of the phone, the cables unclip easily. There's a battery box between the phone and the line jack which takes four AA batteries. To release the metal desk stand, I just needed a screwdriver to press down on a catch. A few screws later and we can see inside the phone. There's a PCB with the audio and ringer electronics in the base. A brown PCB under the keypad looks after the digital side of things, the display and memory, as well as producing the DTMF tones for dialing. 
The loose connector was just glued in and we'll get to repairing that later on. There's a small PCB for the handset switch. The PCB is mounted on two fibre washers. This is a bodge to get the switch to sit at the correct height. I think the crackle when the phone is picked up is just the result of dirty switch contacts, so I'll give it a good dose of contact cleaner spray. And with the phone plugged in, the crackle has gone, even when the switch is gently stroked, which provoked a severe crackle earlier on. Before we move on to investigating the ringer fault, a little bit of telephone theory is required. Telephones are two wire systems. That's to say that a single pair of wires carries the audio in both directions, as well as a DC voltage to drive the circuitry, and dialing and ring control signals. On the left of this diagram we can see the two wires coming in from the phone company. In the UK these are connected to a master socket. This contains just a few components. There's a spark gap to protect our telephones from any nasties on the line, a resistor and a capacitor. The phone line has a DC voltage of minus 50 volts to power the phone. This voltage is not dangerous. When the telephone rings there's an additional AC voltage of around 75 volts RMS. That's potentially hazardous so care must be taken. The capacitor allows just the ring signal to pass through to an extra wire and onto the telephones in the house. In fact, only very old telephones require this extra wire. More modern devices, including the T3, have the ring capacitor inside the phone. And only two wires are required to connect this telephone to the socket. And it's this capacitor that should help us identify the ring circuit in the faulty phone, as I don't have a circuit diagram. Here we can see the incoming line on the green and red wires. It's marked line 1 on the board. I followed the traces around the board to this large capacitor, likely the ring capacitor. Nearby we've got a diode bridge and an IC. This IC produces a ringtone triggered by the 75 volts AC that comes in from the line. One of the pins on the IC feeds the ringer switch on the rear of the phone. Then the wires go to this transformer and onto a small loudspeaker on the base of the phone. Having identified the likely ring circuit, time to take some measurements. Firstly, we can see that the line volts reach the phone. I then called the phone from my mobile and used a scope to look for the ringtone around the board. I can see the signal on the input to the capacitor. However, I found it to be present on all pins of the IC. I had expected to see different signals on some pins, so we looked to have found the faulty part of the circuit. Now, I couldn't find a datasheet for this exact IC, but I found one that looked very similar. The datasheet has an example circuit. It shows that the output signal is on pin 8. The device creates two tones from the incoming ring signal, and you can set the frequency of these using resistors and capacitors across certain pins. It appeared the IC was not getting power, so I took a close look at the board around the chip. I could see one of the ring capacitors pads was lifted from the board. Looking back at the footage I shot earlier, the damaged pad is clearly visible. So I removed the old solder, scraped the green solder resist off the nearby track and applied some fresh solder to create a bridge. And now the telephone ringer works. If we probe pin 8 we can see the chip output. It contains two different tones as expected. Firstly the low frequency 25Hz ring signal, but if we zoom in we can see this is modulated by a 1kHz square wave to produce a sound more suitable for a loudspeaker. With the electronics all sorted, time for a quick clean up. There's some muck under the clear plastic, so I strip down the front panel. And gave it a gentle scrub in warm water with some detergent. While that's drying, time to warm up the glue gun and fix the loose socket back in place. I also cleaned along the length of the cable and finally gave the handset a wipe over to remove the remnants of that sticky label. OK, so time for a test, and who better to call than the phone's rightful owner, my mother.
Hello, is that Mrs. Wild? It's your son, David. Oh, hello. So I've managed to fix up with Jacob Jensen telephone. Oh, that's wonderful. What was wrong with it? Well, there were a few faults. Um, we had the hum on the line. I fixed that by taking the handset apart, putting it back together again, chase that one away. Uh, we had the wonky socket that just needed a dab of glue. And um, the fact that it didn't ring, uh, we had to resolder a capacitor, just uh, needed a little bit of extra solder there, but it's all sorted now. Oh, thank you very much. So I know you won this phone in a competition. Do you remember anything more? Oh, yes. I was entered into a customer draw by Chattels, which is a designer furniture shop in Chester. And I won first prize, which was the Jacob Jensen phone. It was about 25 years ago. Well, hopefully it's in good shape for another 25 years. Uh, I think we'd better wrap up this video. Um, thanks very much for watching. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye for now. Goodbye.